Today we want to focus on reaching the nations next door. And I've invited a friend who has been with the International Mission Board now for a number of years uh, to come and to share with us. Let me introduce Terry Sharp uh, to you. Uh, but I'm really just going to let Terry uh, tell us uh, more about himself. And so, uh, Terry, I just want to say welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, tell Pleasure us a, to be here. a little bit about who you are, your family. Um, I know you're married and you have a daughter and yes. grandbaby and uh, absolutely, yes. especially the grandbaby, right. especially so, the grandbaby. Right. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are. Well, as Tom said, uh, first of all, let me just say how pleased I am to be here today and uh, really appreciate Tom, uh, the UVA, just the, the wonderful job that UVA does and the, the way that they have let out uh, in people group discovery over the years and how they've been so beneficial to the International Mission Board and the project that we're doing now with NAM. So again, thank you, Tom and uh, Josh and all the work that you guys have done in, in, the, in the past with us. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, was raised in East Tennessee, if you can't tell the, from the accent, but uh, I've had the privilege of serving uh, as your missionary in Spain and Brazil. Uh, 2000, uh, 90, in 1991, went to the Tennessee Baptist Convention where I, I did uh, directing language church planning and partnerships. And then in 2001, went back to the International Mission Board in my present role. I work with the Baptist associations, the state conventions, and over the past few years picked up uh, working more closely with our uh, sin cities, our churches across North America Association State Conventions and helping to discover the people groups that God is sending right here and how we can network together to reach them. But uh, married uh, wife Kathy, have one daughter Rebecca, son-in-law, and a new grandbaby that's five months old that we're extremely pleased about. And so far, you have never shown a picture of the grandbaby that's in any right. presentation. And, and none today, so that's good. So, All right, you're going to keep the record. Right. I'm going to keep it going. So, But if they see you personally I, Yeah, I've got a few on my phone for sure, absolutely. Yeah. And then there's Facebook. Of course. <laughs> I, yes. I'm, I am definitely one of those grandparents that like to show off the grandbabies. So. All right, good. Well, the International Mission Board has a new president. David yes, we Platt. do. Tell absolutely. us a little bit about David. Well, we're extremely excited. You can imagine that David Platt is our president. Uh, we have been so blessed to have godly gifted leaderships over the years and uh, David coming on is just bringing uh, a, 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 just an exciting energy a division uh, wanting to reach the nations if you've ever heard him preach and share before he became president you couldn't hear him talk about uh, anything I mean that he was not going to talk about people groups and reaching the unreached and so we're so excited about him he brings a, a just a biblically based goals and everything that we do because he's talked about uh, man we want to empower uh, the limit he basically what he's been saying so much Tom is that he really wants us, and this is kind of a quote from him, we want to empower limitless missionary teams to make disciples and multiplying churches among unreached peoples. So as he continues to roll out a strategy and reset strategy and moves things forward, you're going to hear more and more ways that the local church can be engaged in God's global mission. All right. Now, the International Mission Board has changed its focus over the years. Uh, when you and I first started, the primary focus was on the full-time vocational missionary. But some right, of that's beginning right. to shift. Tell us a little about the shift with IMB. It is. And it started several years ago. Some of the folks here will remember back Bow Mission Thrust in those days. And the idea was that we wanted to see volunteers out of local Baptist churches go and be involved. And so, you know, before it was pretty much 100% career missions, career missionaries that we still are very much involved in and, and very much pursue and want to make that a strategic part of all that we do. But we also know the importance of local volunteers out of the local church going and being engaged. So it kind of started at volunteerism started. And, you know, that's one of the goals that we had was 10,000 volunteers. And we actually broke that way early and so the churches were really excited because they had been praying for missionaries sending out missionaries but then to go and work alongside the missionaries was a tremendous opportunity and so we've continued to look for for ways how can we send more people to to reach the lost and how can we be looking for creative ways to do that and so you you had the journeyman program you had international service corps uh, we have all kinds of stu summer student mission teams that go out and then lately there's been a great emphasis on how could we help leverage marketplace professionals and students who, who work overseas. 
they're already going overseas serving. Mm -hmm. So how could we help equip them and uh, them see themselves as part of this whole uh, strategy of engaging lostness and sharing the good news of Jesus? Now, your specific focus with IMB has, uh, you do work with state conventions and associations, but you have a real passion for what you call the diaspora. Uh, I, and that, in part, is why we asked yeah, you to come today. Absolutely. So tell us a little about that. You know, that. it's so exciting. We want to do everything we can. And you, you hear David, you, you heard uh, Tom previously and Jerry and any president we've had in our missionaries. Our passion is that we want to see every man and woman, boy and girl, have an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, sadly, uh, still 3,000 people groups today in our world, even 2,000 years since Jesus Christ, he came, he lived, he died, he rose again, still 3,000 people groups have not had the privilege of hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we are doing everything we can globally to mobilize the church, to send out missionaries. But also an interesting thing has happened over the, the last decade is we have seen more people on the move than any time in history, mm -hmm. which means that in places around the world where there's limited opportunity or no opportunity to hear the name of Jesus, they're now living in places and cities outside of that country where there is opportunity, like here in North America. And so uh, together over the last few years as we've worked closely with associations, state conventions, North American Mission Board, we're seeing, okay, let's look at the peoples that God has been sending here because many of them are coming from those areas that are unengaged, unreached people groups. And we've got an opportunity now here to share the gospel with them. And so I'm really excited about helping the church discover where people groups are located and then not only discover, but how can we come alongside of them to assist them in knowing how to reach them uh, maybe share resources that may have been developed over the years from churches or, or missionaries or other agencies around the world. How can we come alongside the local church to help equip the local church to engage those people groups? Well, as exciting as this, we are sharing the gospel with people groups who may have not ever had the chance to hear the gospel in their home country. They're here. But so many of them, and you will see a little bit later on, they will keep on communicating back home. Uh, I was recently in the Philippines and had a chance to FaceTime with my grand grandson. Uh, I can't imagine that happening when I was a missionary. There's not even a fax machine. So this the opportunity, our people are connected. Mm -hmm. And so they're FaceTiming, they're Skyping, they're calling. And so just think when someone who is a part of an unreached people group or unengaged unreached people group come to faith in Christ, they can share that back in home. And so the gospel can flow back to their homeland. So I'm really excited about that because because to me, it is just a wonderful strategic thing, an opportunity that God's given to us as a church. Now, the U.S. has always been a nation of immigrants. Yes. Uh, that's, that's how we came to be. But in the mid-1970s, uh, or around 1970, right. things significantly changed. Uh, the laws changed, and uh, the United States has had a flood of immigrants since yes. then. Yes. And Houston is a major uh, portal for Absolutely. immigrants coming into the United right. States, uh, which is why we wanted to have this conversation today, because we lead the state of Texas, and we're one of the leading uh, yes. uh, gateway cities here in the United States yes, for sir. folks coming in. So. I want to just let you uh, take the con, as they right. say, and yes. kind of walk us through what's happening all across the United States well, with immigration. Absolutely. And, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity. One of the exciting things that I shared with you uh, a moment ago is the fact is that God is sending the nations to us. A couple years ago when I was working with one of the refugee resettlement offices, they shared this passage of Scripture. And to me, it was just a, an amazing just just realization and an affirmation that God just think we we want to see everyone have an opportunity to know and to love and to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and your heart's desire my heart's desire and and I and I think about you know when we look in Walmart or we look in Target or we look at our neighbor next door and we see the immigrant or the refugee or the international student do we realize yes they've come for a better way of life Yes, they've come for a better, uh, you know, education. Or maybe they've esca escaping persecution. But that we also understand that maybe, just maybe, and I think, yes, 
God is providing an opportunity for them to hear and to know about him. This passage of scripture became one of my favorites. It says, from one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set before them, the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. So when you look at the immigrant next door, and when you are there and you see them, think about this is an opportunity that they might have the chance to know a believer in Christ Jesus and have the chance to hear the message of Christ and the hope and salvation. You know, that's really a shift because a lot of times, quite frankly, uh, we view the immigrants negatively, uh, forgetting that we were all once upon a time uh, part of an immigrant population, but we view it negatively because they take our jobs sometimes right. or... Right. Uh, we, we feel like they're intruding upon us, but you're saying right. we need to reframe that because really God's bringing them to us. We did a training not, uh, just a couple of weeks ago and the testimony from one of the gentlemen says that uh, there was a gas station that was run by a Hindu family and he used to avoid it because he didn't want to give them any business. Mm. This was his mindset. Mm -hmm. And he said, but after the training, once he started seeing the scripture and started thinking about the opportunity that we have to be show the love of Jesus mm. and share the love of Christ, he says now he intentionally goes there as often as he can because he sees the opportunity to love his neighbor and to share the gospel. Fantastic. Well, tell us what's going on across the U.S. Well, it's really exciting because as we really think about uh, the changes, certainly Houston, you will see uh, so much more rapidly. The churches in Houston, you see the changes taking place in America quicker than sometimes a city like where I'm from in Nashville. But when we think about how the America has changed, uh, America has changed so rapidly over the last decade. So just kind of look at this. You, you expect Houston, you think you expect a place like Dallas, you expect New York City or Chicago or LA being where there's a lot of immigrants and, and there are, but also they're in the heartlands of, of America in the small cities. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it, these are 13 states where the immigrant population grew uh, twice the national average. So look, look at this for just a moment and just get the idea. Alabama uh, has saw a 92% increase. Uh, South Carolina, 88%. Tennessee, where I serve and where I live, in, is 82%. All, all the way down to Oklahoma. So you're seeing immigrant growth. You're seeing this take place all over America, not just in those wonderful gateway cities, but we're seeing that taking everywhere else. But the interesting thing, something very unique took place in 1965. We are a country of immigrants. My parents, your parents, we're all a country of immigrants. But it really something extremely exciting took place in 1965 as far as when we think about the opportunity that we have to, to love people and to share the love of Jesus. Think about in 19, before 1965, primarily the influx of immigrants were from the European countries. Mm -hmm. And so we, we saw that, that kind of take change in 1965 with some of the rules that set place. And then look who started coming. So it kind of stopped the huge influx of people from European countries. And then all of a sudden we started seeing more people from Asia coming. So look at this and just think about this. We're talking about Chinese, Asian Indians, Vietnamese, Laotians, Thai, Burmese, Malaysian, Filipinos, Japanese, <laughs> Koreans, Cambodians, Afghani, Indonesians, Pakistani. And, and when we think about this, we think about these being many places of the world that are that where we see unreached people groups mm -hmm. or unengaged unreached people groups where they have had limited or no access to the gospel, all of a sudden now they're here. And there is that tremendous opportunity to reach out and share the love of Jesus. Not only the immigrants though, and those are the immigrants that are coming here, the immigrating. But we also have another group of people. They're refugees. These are people who are fleeing uh, the disease. They're, they're, they're uh, fleeing for war that's taking place in their country. And, and that's in the headlines. It's in the news all the time. And then we, they're coming here to America. But look at who has come uh, over the past few years. This was uh, one of the last statistics we had. It's a little bit, it, this was a little bit low year. Uh, it's really more about 75 thousand per year but look at this Bhutan Burma, Iraq, Somalia, Cuba, Congo Republic, Iran, Eritrea, Sudan, Ethiopia. And again, look at where people are coming. When you look at the immigrants, when you look at the refugees, they're coming, many of them, from the unreached people groups or the unengaged unreached people groups of the world. And so as we, we think about that, I want us to look at one more. Not only the immigrants that are coming, not only the refugees, but another group of individuals that I'm really excited to, as we think about it, is the international students. And, and the opportunity that we have to reach them 
Right now, we're talking about almost 820,000 international students coming every single year to our universities and campus. Now, think about this. These are the future leaders of our world. Many of the leaders in our world today studied right in our universities and colleges here in North America. You know, Tom, I can't think about... Uh, when I think about that, I can't think about what the missiological implications might be in those mm. countries if those leaders mm -hmm. had been exposed to a believer and they'd come to know a Christian or if they'd come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, how the world would be different today. But we have an opportunity. Look at this. Again, look at the, the last count. China, uh, China amounts for almost 29% of the international students. And then India, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Taiwan, Japan, Vietnam, Mexico, Turkey. And again, when you look, the immigrants, the refugees, the international students, and you see where they're coming from, I believe God's up to something. And Absolutely. we have got a chance to come and join him where he's at work to share the love of Christ with all those who are coming and share the love of Jesus. And we have some of our student ministers here today uh, wow. representing places like the University of Houston, Rice, yes. Texas Medical yes. Center, where a lot of the student population are folks that are coming from around the world. Right. And, and that's what I want to kind of end up with the statistics with this. All these statistics Really, when I share them with you, I, and I know you know this, they're not just statistics, but that represents a men and women, boy and girl that we've been talking about that we want to be able to share the love of Jesus with. And this map that we kind of look at with global status of evangelical Christianity, the, the ones that are shaded the, the darkest in red are the least reached areas of the world. Now, all those places, those countries that are represented here is with immigration and refugees and international students. Have you noticed something? that many of them are from the least reached areas of the world. And so I just wanted to kind of leave that with you because there's a great opportunity. In Houston, uh, I mean, you guys have so many of those immigrants and those refugees and international students right here. Exactly. That's why we wanted to have this conversation today. And it's not gone unnoticed. Uh, yes. Three years ago, the Houston Chronicle uh, did an article in which based on the 2010 census information that had just come out at that time, uh, said that we in the Houston metropolitan area are now the most ethnically and culturally diverse major metropolitan area in the United States. And uh, they will talk a lot about uh, Harris County, uh, but they said Pearland and Missouri City uh, which two areas that are not in Harris County yes. are some of the most ethnically and culturally diverse uh, in the region. And they decided to do a follow-up series this year. And if you look, uh, perhaps you saw this in the Houston Chronicle uh, in uh, just a few weeks ago, they said that now uh, over a million immigrants are here in uh, Harris County, here in Houston, uh, and these folks need to be reached with the gospel. I did just kind of a quick uh, review of the article and highlighted a few of the things for you. Uh, more than a million immigrants, that's one in every four residents of Harris County. Uh, from 2000 to 2010, Houston gained 400,000 foreign-born residents. Only New York City had more. Last year, Harris County received 4,818 refugees. They came from 48, or excuse me, 40 different countries. And as you said, there, there's the student population, the refugee population, and then just the immigrant or mm -hmm. migrating population. Um, two out of every five people speak a language other than English at home every night. And then one-third, uh, this surprised me, one-third of the business owners in Harris County are foreign born. Wow. And the number of Buddhists, Muslims, and Hindus has tripled in the past three decades. And one of the things that I'd always thought was that when the immigrant populations came in, they tended to move to certain enclaves and mm -hmm. live in certain parts of the city. But in Harris County, one of the things that's different is that these folks are dispersed yes. across right. the city. Now, we know a lot of them because of our research, are in the southwest quadrant of the city. Uh, but in truth, they're all across Harris County. Yes. One of the things the article said was that uh, just for a city shaped as said by a million immigrants, you don't have to go any further than a one-mile stretch 
uh, Hillcroft Avenue from Beverly Hill Street to the Southwest Freeway. And in that one mile stretch, you will be able to see the immigration here in our city. And so I just put up a map. This, that X is where we are here at Houston's First Baptist Church. Get on the 610 loop, go out 59 uh, exit there at the Hillcroft area and that little area down in the bottom just about a mile is uh, where you will see a lot of uh, the immigration now certainly not there but I decided let's just go down there and see yeah. so I went down took my camera uh, Ron Towery went with me and uh, we just stood there and uh, basically stood in one parking lot and just kind of did uh, a 360 you know there was the Jerusalem Meat Market, uh, International Food, uh, and you can see some of the folks that uh, were there coming out of the store across the street, uh, another uh, market, and they're serving uh, very specialized meats mm -hmm. for the Muslim uh, community. Uh, we were able to take pictures. Uh, some folks, like the two guys there, couldn't wait to have their picture taken. They thought I was with the newspaper, so they made sure I took their picture and wanted to give me their names. Uh, they're coming out of the Middle East. Uh, the fellow in the lower middle, you see, probably wasn't too happy that his picture was taken. Uh, but you'll notice there at the bottom, cheap ticket to Africa. And that's significant because what that means is there are a lot of folks from Africa that go to this place to buy their meats right. and uh, a lot of them coming from uh, Somalia, for example, uh, Muslim population uh, primarily. Uh, they're coming there and they've realized just this little bitty sign, lots of folks from Africa are coming, they're going to want a cheap ticket back home. If you walk across the street from the Jerusalem meat uh, international food market, uh, you'll find Lee High School. And Lee High School is known for its diverse student population. Uh, many of them exiles that are coming from across the world, many of them still there trying to learn English. I connected with the U.S. Uh, Office of Immigration and Refugee Affairs and uh, Again, Harris County received 4,818 folks in 2014. Uh, that's up from 2013. And you'll notice they came largely from uh, Cuba, from Iraq, Afghanistan, and Burma. But Somalia and Iran are a couple of places uh, that I mentioned because uh, here we met folks there. Uh, this mother and her son uh, went to the market to uh, buy halal meat and uh, uh, was able to take their picture. I uh, had to block out her face because he said, you know, it, uh, it's against our religion to uh, take a picture of her. And so I said, really, tell me about that. And it was really interesting just standing there in the parking lot, how freely and easily we mm -hmm. were able to engage in conversation. Then he began to clarify. I said, well, not really against our religion. It's just you, you're not supposed to do it without my dad's permission. Uh, so I said, okay, we'll, we'll block out the face. And uh, I asked what brought them here because they came from a long way, I found out, uh, to buy meat. They drove all across Houston to get it. Uh, he said, we came here because of the way the meat's prepared. They are Muslims. Mm -hmm. And he said, we need it prepared in a certain way, so we'll drive all the way across. They're from Somalia first generation coming from Somalia. And, and of course, this is yes. uh, a very he heavily Muslim area mm -hmm. and not necessarily the safest area uh, for folks like us to go to in the world. Yes. Uh, walked into one of the stores. Um, uh, the gentleman that you see uh, on the right is uh, from, he said, Persia. He's from Iran and uh, came here, first generation. And uh, I showed his picture because this was the uh, Persian New Year when we were down there a few weeks ago taking these pictures and he was in charge of fire jumping. Uh, fire jumping is uh, a special part of their New Year's celebration. He said, yes, we, we jump over the fire. I got him to explain it to me. He said, we jump over the fire and we leave our yellow in the fire and then we draw warmth from the fire. And of course, by now I'm confused. I said, you leave your yellow in the fire? He said, well, yeah, yellow represents the bad stuff from the last year. We just leave that in the fire like yellow bile. So, yeah, it's a very visceral kind of, of uh, illustration. But he said, yeah, we leave that behind. We jump over the fire. We draw the warmth from it. Well, he was in charge of the fire walking. Mm -hmm. But it, it also reminds us when these immigrants come, they don't just pack their belongings. They pack their religious history yes, and heritage. And... Uh, 
Ron and I went a little further down the road in the Wilchrist area. There we uh, found this uh, Buddhist temple uh, just a little bit off of the road. One of the largest Hindu temples in North America mm -hmm. is a little further out southwest in Stafford. The lower right, you see the mosque that Hakeem Olajuwon built. It's in downtown Houston. Uh, and the lower left quadrant shows uh, folks practicing Santeria. It, it's just uh, a reminder of all the various uh, kinds of religious expression. You know, when they came over from Europe, they were primarily coming from uh, Christian heritage. Yes. Uh, Catholic, Protestant, uh, and some Jewish, but they primarily came with a Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. But now as folks are coming in, uh, they're coming in with completely different world views. Uh, if you want to do some research, let me just mention a couple of places to you. One is called The Arda, T-H-E-A-R-D-A dot com. It's the Association of Religious Data Archives. And they compile the data. It's probably the most accurate resource for what's going on religiously in North America. Uh, uh, here in the United States primarily, uh, what's going on here uh, from a religious perspective. And you can go there, you can see the data, it's readily accessible. And what they do is compile data like every year we uh, fill out our annual church profiles, if you haven't done that yet, hint, hint, uh, fill out our annual church profiles, send that into the associational office or the state convention or Lifeway, and we compile all that data to see what's going on in Baptist church life. Well, other groups do th similar kinds of things, and these folks gather all of this public data, mm -hmm. and they put it on this website, and it gives us probably the best sense of what's going on. So the population, based on the 2010 census and the reports that were sent in at that time. Uh, the population in uh, uh, the Houston area, 5.9 million people. And what they identify as they look across and compile the data is 2.9 billion, basically 3 million people are identified as, quote, unclaimed. That means they do not identify any religious identity. Uh, so they identify themselves as, mm -hmm. as, as unclaimed by anyone. Uh, that's basically 50% of the population here in the greater Houston area. That if, if you think about that for a moment, uh, three million people, uh, there are only three cities in the United States, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, that have more than three million, and Houston, of course, that have more than three million people. Uh, <laughs> So we have one of the largest populations of unclaimed uh, here in the United States. And then if you look at the other religions, uh, you know, that number is a little bit different. It's about 500,000 uh, identify some other kind of religious history and heritage. Well, there are only 50, yeah, 50 countries in the world. Uh, that have a smaller population than those that are coming from around the world here and some of the places that we're trying yeah. uh, to get missionaries uh, to serve. I uh, tried to do a little work and, and look and say, okay, well, what are the public figures showing? Mm -hmm. Well, they show uh, 157,800 uh, Muslim uh, population, uh, basically a 20,000 Buddhist population, 15,000 Hindu population, then Orthodox Jew and Baha'i. Uh, you can begin to see the numbers. If you want right. to really tear into them, you can find it on theyarda.com. All of that's to say, you know, we live in a mission field. Yes. Absolutely. And so my question to you, Terry, this, this is kind of the big question. Yes. What are the best practices? What are things being done yeah. across the United States to reach these populations? What are some things that we as churches can do here in Houston? I, I think one of the very first things that uh, your church can do starting this week uh, is that while we absolutely would love to see missionaries be sent out of your church, God calling those missionaries, we're sending those missionaries out. We'd love to see individuals, volunteers, marketplace professionals going and serving around the world. 
But as much as we want you to go out and get on the plane and go engage the nations, we need to go and welcome the nations. And mm -hmm. one of the first things that we can do is be a welcomer. And we can welcome those immigrants. We can welcome those refugees. Welcome, we can welcome those international students. And so being a welcomer, um, hospitality, show hospitality, show Christian love. Uh, for example, the immigrants that are coming in, you know, we, they are, you think about it, uh, some of you uh, I know around the audience here, you've, you've either served overseas as a missionary, you've been on short-term mission trips, or you've, lived, you've worked there with a company. And you know how it is when you go overseas. You don't know anyone. Uh, you're not even sure sometimes about the systems that they've got in place. Mm -hmm. And so just having a friend, someone who is there being a friendly face to, to have them over for coffee, have them over for tea, develop a friendship, being a welcomer. Refugees come. And uh, I know here in the Houston area or uh, even, even across America, we've got all kinds of refugee resettlement offices that are begging for churches that they will be there to welcome a uh, refugee when they get off the plane. And so the, the opportunity that you have is that, think about, these are people who, who God's put on your heart. You love these people. You're praying for these people. You may even be trying to engage them globally, but we have got an opportunity for a day by day, month by month, they will have a relationship with these people in a loving, caring way. And so uh, you can go to the airport. Uh, you can welcome them. You can help them get settled into their apartment. Um, you can help them to learn about, because so many of these people who come from the refugee camps, uh, they may have been in those refugee camps 10 years, 20 mm -hmm. years. And so they're needing to learn the basic things of the household, uh, everything from a freezer to a microwave to, you know, the, how we operate the stoves. And you think about the last time, uh, if you maybe went to set up an, a, a new appointment somewhere with a dentist or with a doctor or something else, and they hand you this notebook and say, fill this paperwork out. Oh, yeah. And 20 minutes later, you know, you finish. And it depends on how fast you are filling it all out. But, but think about a, a refugee who comes in. He's limited. Well, she's limited on her English ability. Uh, but, but even if she has good command of the English, this is a process that's very difficult to do. And so helping them set up a bank account, helping their children. When their children get here, very much like uh, missionary children when they go overseas, they're kind mm -hmm. of in a school uh, and learning... Uh, uh, whether it's Spanish or Portuguese and another language. And so the parent is still struggling with the language. And so how in the world do they help the children with their homework? So we can help the children with their homework. We can help them uh, know about shopping here. When you walk, walk into the grocery store, even if you've been on the field a long time and you come back to America, all of a sudden you notice that there's 50 brands of cereal. Wow, which one do I pick? What does this mean? But simple acts of kindness, reaching out, really, really trying to serve the immigrant refugee community. I know of a couple of associations uh, and uh, churches that uh, really have like, uh, like a shower for the refugee family. Uh, maybe they can't be there and week by week, month by month, serve the refugee, but they want to be able to help mm -hmm. that refugee when they get settled in. So they might have a shower. They might uh, try to help furnish uh, a room of the house. Or they might can merely help with backpacks of, of uh, you know, kind of school supplies and helping that uh, refugee child get started. The, the same thing with the international students. Your church right now could call, after you finish this meeting today, you can call your university. You've, you've already got some campus ministers, you said, we here. Did. You can connect with them. But most all of our universities that have international students, and again, there's 820,000, and that's growing. They want, these international students would love to have a friend. And uh, each one of the universities will have some kind of a ministry where they would love to have uh, an American friend. And so you have an opportunity to do life with them. You can have them over for meals. You can have them over for holidays. You can have them over for birthdays. You can go to weddings. You can just do life with these international students. And by having an opportunity to speak into their life and to love them, we have the chance to demonstrate the love of Jesus and the good news of Jesus Christ as well. So right now you can do two things today. You could contact your university, find out if there's an opportunity, and I'm sure there will be on your campus to go ahead and immediately start connecting with an international student and start you know, pouring in your life into their life because they want to learn about America sure. when they come. And the same is true with refugees. You could go ahead and contact one of the local refugee resettlement offices and say, how could we individually or as a church be involved in helping in this refugee's life? So there's a 
few practical ways that you can be involved. And I think that these are, the, you know, one last thing is that maybe you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant about doing some of these things. Maybe you'd be willing just to offer your services of, of your university. Sometimes the university just needs you to go and pick up a student who's arriving. Just give them a ride from the airport to their dorm or from the airport to their hotel or their, uh, their apartment. And so you, you could just provide transportation. And what you'll find out is when you do that, you'll find out, you know, they speak English well. And this was a great experience. And then you might be open to do more. So if you're, you've got folks in your church that, that seems like they would be really like to be involved in this, but they're hesitant to do maybe jump right in. Maybe just uh, providing a ride for an international student to their dorm or through their apartments way to get started. When I really was first introduced to how important this is, uh, I saw the movie. It was about the Lost Boys of yes, Sudan. Yes. And it, it was kind of a, a documentary of how they came here. They came to the Houston area. And you see them trying to... Uh, integrate into life yes. and, and something as simple as uh, getting a driver's license yes. I mean yes. we don't even think about things like that but I mean there's a some terrific scenes in there of how they go try to get the driver's license l try to learn how to drive yes you know finding jobs there there are lots of ways but just the idea of uh, acts of kindness yes. you know welcome yes. them well whether it's a, a refugee population refugee family or a student uh, population coming in what else can we do well, you know, one of the, the exciting things that uh, you can do is that we, we really would really like to help you connect. Uh, one of the things is that we really want to help individuals. Who, we, we are Southern Baptist or missions people. We're a great commission people. We want to see people have the good news of Jesus Christ, hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and have an opportunity to respond. So one of the things that you can do is to try to be aware of who is in your community. Uh, together right now, North American Mission Board, International Mission Board, along with other partners or churches, association state conventions we're trying to map where people groups are in North America I know you guys have done a great job in Houston gathering that data but when we look around the world you can go and kind of look all across the world and identify where people groups are but not North America we have not had that ability until That's now right. and so to now we're trying to to know where people groups are now why is that important well first of all we want to know we, we all want to know our community because we're responsible to love our community to share the love of Christ with our community and that includes the the people groups that God is sending here, either, either as immigrants or internationals or refugees. And so identify where people groups are in your community and find out, is anyone there already doing some type of ministry among them? It may be English class. It could be citizenship class. It could be help them get a driver's license, doing some of these acts of kindness. But the, the second thing you can do is that you may be already engaged globally in missions. You already adopt a people group you're praying for on a regular basis. I know a lot of Sunday school classes mm -hmm. and churches do that. And what we'd like to do is try to assist you. So if you're already engaging globally through prayer or in going physically to those places to share the love of Christ, we'd love to help you discover where that same people group is here in North America. And, and uh, because the exciting thing is so many times churches are engaged globally and they don't realize that they're also their people groups also right here in North America. So they, they can continue to go there, but also be engaging here in North America. Uh, and so we want to come alongside of you as you're thinking about engaging that people group here. Uh, we have we have uh, uh, churches who are already working among that people group. We can connect you to them so that you can learn from their experiences, learn about their people group. We have missionaries who may have worked among some of these people groups. Mm -hmm. And so we can come alongside of you to help you know about worldview, uh, know about some of the understandings of, of what they believe, uh, share with you some best practices of reaching them. And uh, so we want, we want to help connect you to, to churches and or missionaries or volunteers who may have worked uh, and served among some of these people groups that you're discovering in your community. And uh, then, then, again, we want to help resource you. One of the exciting things we're seeing take place, Tom, and I love this, is we have opportunities to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. You in Houston and uh, this association, you, the world and the, the nations have come here mm -hmm. uh, where way before Nashville and Birmingham realized that there were peoples and people groups in those cities. So you, you and other global cities across North America 
have, have a great deal of expertise that we can learn from. And so you can help us. Uh, and so we want to learn from you. So our global cities around the world where we have personnel and the global cities here, we want to learn from one another. So we're trying to create opportunities and venues. We, we have opportunities where we can physically get together and our city strategists globally and our city strategists in North America get together and learn from each other. And then we also do webinars that that's open to everyone. Uh, we are, are looking for ways to uh, hear from people who are sharing best practices, maybe churches who are reaching out to Bhutanese, Nepali, or maybe South Asians. And so learning from them, you know, what, what are some of the best practices in loving my neighbor? How can we do this better? Uh, what, what's, what have I been doing? And, and kind of learn from each other. Uh, we have a, a webinar coming up soon on international students. That's just how we can strategically reach out and love to the international students that God is sending our way. And so these are some of the things that we can do. We can, we can uh, certainly uh, teach each other, learn from each other. I think there's a great value in that. And, uh, and so we want to do that and some of the things that we, we look forward to in, in the days ahead. Terry, you have even developed uh, a website. I yes. I hoped we, were, we would be able to pull this up, but I'm going to have to do some changing uh, to show that. But right. tell us about ethnicity.com. Yeah, ethnicity.com. You is better a, spell that. Yeah, it's 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 kind of a play on ethnicity, but it's ethne, the patatai ethne, the people groups ethne, E-T-H-N-E, and then C-I-T-Y. Uh, certainly, we, we want to provide opportunities for people to learn from one another. And so Ethne City is a website that we're, the IMB is hosting, but it's for everyone. So all the other Great Commission Christians and, and, and uh, churches and associated state conventions, we hope this will be a site for everyone that we're hosting. And the ideal of that site is to do several things. One is to, to cast awareness, like we're doing here, mm -hmm. that uh, Tom has provided opportunity for us to kind of learn the fact that the nations are here that, and they're, they're living next door. And so how can we reach the unreached in the urban setting? So we're, we provide you know, articles, we provide testimonies, we provide devotionals, casting vision. The other thing we do is we do have uh, about a monthly webinar that is available for people to come and sign up. Uh, we have had uh, everything from uh, a refugee resettlement office, National Refugee Resettlement Office, do some webinars talking about how the local church can reach out in love and the importance of reaching refugees, to Immigrant Alliance talking about what the local church can do to assist those new immigrants that are coming, new Americans, and help them to settle in to their new way of life. And, and as I mentioned to you, one that's coming up soon next month on reaching international so these webinars if you can participate they're during the daytime so some people have a difficult time doing those and being participating with them live we usually do about 30 40 minutes of presentation last 20 or 30 minutes or so of dialogue with each other so we'll have people from overseas we'll have people across north america learning from each other but let's say you can't participate well we record most of those and we have those available where your small group your sunday school class uh, others can can be a part of that and and uh, see what's going on, and so I'll let you scroll down on there. Okay. But uh, you'll notice to the right hand side, sign up for webinar. So we have one called the Kingdom of God and Global Mission, and then Money, Honor, and Relationship Biblical Look at Patronage. Patronage. That's really about the the Honor Shame uh, Society and how we better understand Honor Shame and how we share in that. Uh, but we we've got resources. Let's just say you've discovered. My neighbor next door is from another country, and you know I really would have love to have opportunity because we just celebrated Easter. Mm -hmm. If you'll notice on here, how to use Easter eggs to share the gospel, you thought, wow, you know that's uh, kind of unique. So we just posted uh, an idea on how you can use Easter eggs because again, international students, immigrants, they're they're kind of interested. What is Easter? You know what what are, what is this holiday? We have a chance to share with them the the true true meaning of this holiday, and so. Uh, for example, if you had your immigrant friend over and you had him for your meal and maybe even went to church with you and you wanted to kind of share with him and, and maybe let's say he knows English really, really well, but you would say, you know, I really would love to put the word of God in his you know, his heart language in his hand. And so you can't go down to most of the Christian bookstores and pick up mm -hmm. uh, so many of the of the scriptures, uh, you know, whether that be a New Testament or the whole Bible and Old Testament, New Testament or a track or Jesus film in that heart language. So what we try to do is collect, again, from other Great Commission Christians around the globe, resources. So, yeah, you find someone from a country and you say, you know what, 
I'd like to see if there's a Bible or there's a Jesus film in their heart language. So you can go quickly, find that, order that, and make that, that gift, that presentation to your immigrant friend or your international student. So the website is designed to help you with resources, help you connect. There's a place on there where you can actually fill out saying, you know what, we've discovered a people group in our community. We'd really love to know more about that people group, but we'd love to have some help going to map this people group. And so we can help you connect. Maybe uh, we might have a missionary, uh, you know, maybe he speaks Spanish or Portuguese or he speaks another language. And you say, you know what, this would be helpful to know worldview, know how to better engage them with the gospel. You, you can fill us out and we'll help connect you with a missionary that maybe is on stateside assignment or maybe he's a retired missionary and we can can help connect you together so that you can uh, find out more and, and know how better to reach, reach and relate to the immigrant or the, the refugee that's here in the community. If they want information on Houston, yes. uh, you can go to our website, ubahouston.org. You can connect with folks like Sally Hensey or Josh Ellis or Campo Londonio, uh, uh, Ricky Bradshaw. We have folks uh, we know uh, what's going on here in the city. In fact, the information you you talk about yes. that you all have yes. uh, on Houston uh, begins yes, here. Absolutely. And uh, we're delighted to share that. But then you all have additional resources. We, we may do. be able to locate the people, but you know who, yeah. say, the retired missionaries yeah. or the furloughing yeah. missionaries absolutely. are, and you can connect us. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to do through this ethnicity.com. There's a place on there, connect, over to the connect button, and you can just fill that out and send it to us. The other thing, you just say that you've, you've got a heart for a people group, and, and you've not been able to discover them here in Houston, but mm -hmm. you, we might can tell you where else they're at outside of Houston, maybe in Texas, or it could be in another state, and you're saying, you know what, I, I would love to know where they're at. We're working together, and again, you guys were very instrumental. In fact, Josh and I, we, we went across the, the globe uh, in between his doctoral work. Let me tell you, this guy here, he would, he would get up and do our training, but then at night in the mornings, he would still be up down in the lobby studying for his PhD. So I know now he's trying to catch up on his sleep uh, after yes, all of his PhD yes, studies. Yes. But he helped us get started on a thing we call peoplegroups.info. And what we're doing is we're trying to map the U.S. and then we're capturing the information about where people groups are located on peoplegroups.info. So let's just say you've got a heart for a certain people group. You're working with them in Houston, but you say, I'd love to know where else they're located because you might want to exactly. take a mission trip. You might exactly. want to take a youth group. You might want to take an adult group. So think about not just going with volunteers overseas, but think about where you could go right here in North America with a, with a missional group of volunteers. Sure. And we, on peoplegroups.info, you can go and look and see if that people group is located in other cities of North America besides Houston. Fantastic. Well, Terry, I just want to say thank you for taking time to be here. The uh, UBA has worked in tandem with the International Mission Board Absolutely. for many, many years. And we're so grateful And for the we're delighted to do that because we learn from you all. Uh, and what we have learned, what uh, our staff has learned from the International Mission Board about reaching folks around the world, about people yes. groups, about church planning movements, we've tried to bring back here to our setting yes. and contextualize that and use that and we've also used it to train others yes. across the United States so we are deeply indebted to you uh, the folks that work with you and we appreciate we, you very, very we're much. We're so grateful thank you for that and also I, want, I don't want to leave without thanking you I want to thank each of you for your praying for your missionaries around the world uh, and also your giving through cooperative program Lottie Moon Christmas offering so I, I would be negligent to leave here and not thank you so thank you so very much first of all for the privilege of being with you and for all that you're doing for the kingdom uh, and certainly and reaching people groups both locally and globally but also your giving and your praying so thank you all so very much You're it's welcome. a privilege to be with you thank you terry